Hello there, Babs and Babettes, and welcome back to the Samuel Brunel Elliot channel. Uh, do like, subscribe, go and like the Facebook page, link in the description below, all of that jazz. And today is a video that I've been working on for a rather long time, and it's time to have the history of King George VI. So King George VI is one of my personal heroes in life. And I've studied him for a long time. He's kind of what sparked my uh, love and interest of the Windsor Dynasty. And uh, we're going to be talking about him today. And I'd like to just show you something before we start. So here is King George VI. He sits on my desk. And he's all, I've also got a portrait of him downstairs in the room along with his daughter. And um, I just... One of my heroes, love him. So I'm going to do a full video on the history of him. Stay tuned until the end, because after the ending of the video, I'm going to have a bit of a tribute to King George VI. And uh, I hope you enjoy this video. It's taken me a long time to, uh, you know, finish it. So enough of that. Let's get to it. The History Corner. Prince Albert Frederick Arthur George was never meant to take the British throne. Known as Bertie to his close friends and family, he would unexpectedly become King George VI. To my mind, King George VI is one of the most underrated of British monarchs. He is also one of my heroes in life for many reasons. He struggled greatly after his brother abdicated the throne in 1936. Unknowingly, he would be one of Britain's great monarchs through war and peacetime. This is his story. Prince Albert Windsor was born on the 14th of December 1895 at York Cottage on the Sandringham Estate in Norfolk during the reign of his great-grandmother Queen Victoria until her death in 1901. Coincidentally, Prince Albert's birth would have been the 34th anniversary of his great-grandfather's death, that being Albert, Prince Consort. The Prince of Wales, later King Edward VII, was uncertain on how Queen Victoria would react to the birth on that date. He wrote to his eldest surviving son, the Duke of York, saying, The Queen had been rather distressed. Then two days later, he wrote again to the Duke of York, saying, I really think it would gratify her if you yourself proposed the name Albert. The Duchess of York, later Queen Mary, seemed to have liked the name. Queen Victoria must have also been very pleased as she wrote to both the Duke and Duchess of York, saying, I am all impatient to name the new baby born on such a sad day, but rather more dear to me, especially as he will be called by that dear name, which is a byword for all that is great and good. Queen Victoria suffered greatly from grief after the death of Prince Albert on the 14th of December 1861. In fact, in a national mourning, all metal fencing and lampposts, some being elaborately coloured, were painted black as a sign of mourning. She never got over Albert, Prince Consort's death. We see the remnants on old metal fences and such today. He was baptised Albert Frederick Arthur George at St Mary's Magdalene Church, Sandringham, three months later. In the family, he was known informally as Bertie. Albert was fourth in line to the throne at birth, after his grandfather, King Edward VII, and then it would be his father, King George V and then his elder brother, Edward. Prince Albert, Bertie, suffered from ill health in his younger years and was described as easily frightened and somewhat prone to tears. How very much Albert, Bertie, would prove them all wrong. Like most aristocratic upbringings in that era, all in all, he spent little time with his parents. At the age of around eight, Albert developed a stutter that would plague him for most of his life. He was also naturally left-handed, but he was forced to write with his right hand, which may not have helped with his speech impediment. For the time, this was common practice. He would also suffer from chronic stomach problems as well as not knees, which required him to wear painful corrective splints in order to cure this. When Queen Victoria died on the 22nd of January 1901, the Prince of Wales succeeded her as King Edward VII. Prince Albert moved up to third in line to the throne, after his father and elder brother. 
Albert attended the Royal Naval College, Osborne, as a naval cadet in 1911, and although he came bottom of his class, he managed to get into the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. In 1913, he spent six months on the training ship HMS Cumberland in the West Indies and on the east coast of Canada. He was rated a midshipman aboard HMS Collingwood on the 15th of September 1913. He spent three months in the Mediterranean but never overcame his seasickness, which he suffered with greatly. Three weeks after World War I broke out, he was sent to Aberdeen in order to remove his appendix, which was an operation performed by Sir John Marnock. During the Battle of Jutland, he was a turret officer on board Collingwood on the 31st of May until the 1st of June 1916. Due to his ill health, he did not see further action as he had to have an operation due to his judenal ulcer, sorry if pronounced wrong, a stomach ulcer which causes mass amounts of pain and vomiting, for which he had an operation for in November of 1917. In 1918, Albert went to the newly established Royal Air Force and he served as an officer commanding No. 4 Squadron of the Boys Wing at Cranwell until August 1918, before reporting to the RAF's Cadet School at St. Leonard's on Sea. Albert would become the first member of the British Royal Family to be certified as a fully qualified pilot. Albert wanted to serve on the continent while the war was still in progress, and welcomed a posting to General Trenchant's staff in France, so on the 23rd of October, he flew across the Channel to Ortigny. For the closing weeks of the war, he served on the staff on the RAF Independent Air Force at its HQ in Nancy, France. He remained in the continent for two months until he was posted back to Britain. In October of 1919, Albert went to Trinity College, Cambridge, where he studied history, economics and civics for a year with historian R.V. Lawrence as his official mentor. On the 4th of July 1920, his father then made him Duke of York, Earl of Inverness and Bar Baron of Killarney. He began at this point to take on more royal duties. He would often tour coal mines, factories and rail yards. He was so frequent at visiting these locations and giving speeches that the public started to call him the Industrial Prince. Due to his frequent visits to the industries of the day, he gained an interest in the working conditions of these factories and mines that he had witnessed. Indeed, he became the president of the Industrial Welfare Society and held this position for 16 years. He arranged summer camps for boys between 1921 and 1939 that brought together boys from all walks of life and backgrounds and brought them together. For me, this shows how down-to-earth Albert really was. He felt happiest when he was being with the people. Playing tennis or watching the football matches in the stalls with his fellow fans, Albert cared and admired the British public and knew of many of their plights and difficulties that they faced day to day. This could be because he related their plights and difficulties to his own battles. This is something that even before people even imagined him as king had a genuine affection for Albert. Edward, on the other hand, was a very different story. Much of his time was spent in an almost stereotypical way, partying and cared little for duties that had to be performed, whereas Albert was passionate about the duties and responsibilities that were and are the monarch's job to perform. Albert also had a first-hand knowledge of the importance of their duties from the public themselves. In 1920, he met Lady Elizabeth bowes leon whom he had not seen since his childhood. They would fall in love. However, she would reject his marriage proposal twice in 1921 and 1922. This is reportedly due to the fact that of the sacrifices and responsibilities of the royal family. Finally, however, after a protracted courtship, Elizabeth agreed to marry him on the 26th of April 1923. They were married at Westminster Abbey. In this time, it was considered a modernisation of the monarchy as Elizabeth was not of royal birth. In April of 1924 until April of 1925, they both toured Kenya, Uganda and Sudan. Due to Albert Stammer, he hated public speaking. On the 31st of October 1925, 
He gave the closing speech at the British Empire Exhibition at Wembley, which was an ordeal for him, and it was soon after this incident that he soon started seeing the Australian-born speech therapist Lionel Logue. The Duke and Logue practiced breathing techniques, and sometimes the Duchess would also rehearse with them patiently. It is unknown what exactly Logue did to help Albert as he kept his methods private, however there was a noticeable improvement in Albert's speech. The movie The King's Speech docudramatizes this collaboration between the two. Albert and Logue became very close friends, with the King writing in a style that showed a close friendship using words such as My Dear Logue and signing each letter Bertie. Such was the improvement of his speech that he opened the new Parliament House in Cumbria, Australia during a tour of the Empire with the Duchess in 1927. Although the King's speech has its timeline slightly shifted and some parts have been used for artistic effect, I still find it a great and realistic representation of what Lionel Logue and the King were both like both together and also the story behind it. Very good film, highly recommend it. I think that would even bigger mistake. <laughs> I'm not a king. <laughs> I'm a naval officer, that's all I know. <laughs> I'm not a king, I'm not a king. Albert then journeyed by sea to Australia, New Zealand and Fiji. Then to Jamaica, where Albert played double tennis with Mr. Bertrand Clark, a gentleman of Jamaican descent. This was celebrated locally and seen as a display of equality between races. The Duke and Duchess had two children, Elizabeth, whom the family affectionately called Lilibet, who was born on the 21st of April 1926, and Margaret, who was born on the 21st of August 1930. The loving family lived at 145 Piccadilly rather than in one of the royal palaces. So admired was the Duke that the Prime Minister R.B. Bennett considered him for the role of Governor General of Canada. King George V had severe reservations about Prince Edward, not just due to his lack of care for duty and responsibility. He is noted as saying, After I am dead, that boy will ruin himself in 12 months. I pray to God that my eldest son, Edward, will never marry and that nothing will come between Bertie and Lilibet and the throne. His concerns were not unfounded in this regard. Edward at this time was moving further away from public duty and towards indulging in his own appetites. Albert is known to have criticised Edward's attitude towards duty. Sounds like you've studied our wretched constitution. Sounds like you haven't. That's what this is about, brushing up. I'm trying to... Yearning for a larger audience, are we, B -b 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 Bertie? Don't... I'm sorry. Younger brother trying to push elder brother off the throne. Wallace. Albert had always been a very down-to-earth person. He didn't always see himself as a duke, but rather an English country gentleman. However, he had an intense respect and knowledge of his constitutional responsibilities and could not stand his brother's uncaring nature towards these important matters. On the 20th of January 1936, King George V passed and Edward immediately ascended the throne as King Edward VIII. As it is well known that his reign only lasted 12 months until he abdicated in December of that same year to marry his love Wallace Simpson, a twice divorcee. Even before the official abdication, however, it was well known that he would give up the throne. Albert tried to speak to his brother in a heated debate when Edward told Albert he was to marry Wallace. Edward was advised by the then British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin that he could not remain king and marry a divorced woman with two living ex-husbands. When one becomes sovereign, they are not just the head of state, armed forces, navy and such. They also become the head of the Church of England, and in this time, the head of the Church of England could not marry a divorcee. It is worth considering that due to Edward's attitudes towards duty, the government may have been cautious of him at 
the time, and people did not look at Edward the same way that they did Albert. Although he was loved, it was well known of his socialite type lifestyle he had been leading. The abdication was made official on the 11th of December, 1936. This decision has been made less difficult to me by the sure knowledge that my brother, with his long training in the public affairs of this country and with his fine qualities, will be able to take my place forthwith. Albert knew what this meant. The day before, on the 10th of December, Albert went to the Queen Mother to discuss this. Albert writes in his diary, When I told her what happened, I broke down like a child. You're a greedy, thoughtless, scheming, cold-hearted... How can he bow down to me as king? How can I receive his homage? How will I ever be able to do the damn job? Albert was terrified and felt totally unprepared for this destiny. There was public scrutiny that said Albert was physically and psychologically incapable of handling the kingship. Indeed, Albert agreed with them. Albert took the name King George VI to emphasise continuity with his father and restore confidence in the monarchy. The beginning of his reign was mainly taken up by questions of his elder brother. There was questions over his position now in the royal family. During Edward's last broadcast, he was introduced as His Royal Highness Prince Edward. However, George felt that due to his brother's abdication, he lost the right to these titles. George's first act as king was to confer upon his brother the title Duke of Windsor, with the style Royal Highness, but no wife nor children of the Duke of Windsor could bear royal titles. King George VI then bought Balmoral and Sandringham from Edward as these were privately owned and did not pass to him automatically. Three days after his succession, King George VI, on his 41st birthday, invested his wife, the new Queen Consort, with the Order of the Garter. On the 12th of May 1937, the coronation took place at Westminster Abbey. The Queen Mother, Queen Mary, broke with tradition and attended the coronation to show her son the support that he so desperately needed. After the coronation, two overseas tours were taken to France and to North America. However, as we know at this time in history, war loomed on the horizon with tensions high. The newly coronated King, George VI, was well aware of this factor. It dominated his reign. Neville Chamberlain wanted to appease the growing threat of Hitler and the Nazi regime. After the Munich Pact of 1938, Chamberlain was invited onto Buckingham Palace balcony. This was usually reserved for just the royals. There was growing opposition to Chamberlain in the House of Commons, however, and this act did cause a stir. In May and June of 1938, the King and Queen toured Canada and the United States. It was the first visit of a British reigning monarch to North America, although he had been there prior to his accession. They were accompanied by the Canadian Prime Minister, William Leon Mackenzie King, to present themselves in North America as King and Queen of Canada. Both Governor-General of Canada, Lord Tweedsmere, and Mackenzie King hoped that the King's presence in Canada would demonstrate the principles of the Statute of Westminster 1931, which gave full sovereignty to the British Dominions. On the 19th of May, King George VI personally accepted and approved the Letter of Credence of the new US Ambassador to Canada. George gave a speech, and in it he states, The free and equal association of the nations of the Commonwealth. This must have stirred up support for his personal handling on the matter. King George VI was happy to present this speech, as he was at the time still having speech therapy with his good friend Lionel Logue. 
Although he struggled, it was improving thanks to Logue's mentoring. King George's sixth popularity and love grew. However, the storm had arrived in September of 1939. Due to the Nazi invasion of Poland, Britain and her self-governing dominions other than Ireland declared war on Germany. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. King George's six suspicions had come to fruition. The government tried to force the King and Queen to evacuate with their two daughters to Windsor Castle. They refused, but spent some evenings there. On the 7th of September 1940, the first of the London Blitz airstrikes occurred and killed over 1,000 citizens, mostly in the East End. On the 13th of September, the King and Queen narrowly avoided death when two German bombs exploded in the courtyard at Buckingham Palace while they were there. There would be nine direct hits from air raids during the war. In defiance, the Queen declared, I am glad that we have been bombed. It makes me feel we can look the East End in the face. The royal family shared not just the dangers, but also had the same deprivations, such as rationing, limited water use, no heating, and the palace windows to be boarded up. King George VI refused to leave London. He would often go to the sites of the London bombings, not just to pay respects, but to offer whatever support that he could. In 1940, Winston Churchill replaced Neville Chamberlain. However, George would have preferred Lord Halifax. George had reservations when it came to Churchill, However, after getting to know one another, and when Churchill needed support in the war effort, King George VI gave it. The King and British Prime Minister developed the closest personal relationship in modern British history between a monarch and a Prime Minister. Every Tuesday, for four and a half years, the two men met privately for lunch and to discuss the war effort in private and to speak frankly to one another without prying eyes. You'll have my support. You shall have my support at any hour. Through the war, the King and Queen provided the much needed morale boosting visits throughout the United Kingdom, visiting bomb sites, munitions factories, and troops. The King also visited France, North Africa, and Malta. The King's role during the Second World War cannot be underestimated. He stood, as did Churchill, as a beacon of hope and defiance against one of the most evil regimes in history. After the war, King George VI relinquished the title of Emperor as the Empire declined. In August of 1947, India and Pakistan became two independent dominions and India becoming a republic in 1950. However, until his death, he remained King of Pakistan. India would remain within the Commonwealth, which was King George VI's main focus and passion. 1947 is when the modern Commonwealth was created. Although it officially started in the 1920s, King George VI was passionate about the Commonwealth being a family of nations, each one voting in or out of it. He was head of the Commonwealth until his death when it was offered to his daughter, Queen Elizabeth II, whom is still head of the Commonwealth to this day. In 1947, the King and his family toured Southern Africa. The Prime Minister of the Union of South Africa, Jan Smuts, was facing an election and hoped to make political capital from the visit. During the visit, he was instructed by the South African government to shake hands only with those of white ethnicity, which he was horrified and disgusted by. He referred to his South African bodyguards as the Gestapo. King George VI had friends and political friendship with people of all walks of life and backgrounds. 
For him, this would have been horrifying to be told this. Smuts did lose this election, however, and the following year a new South African government instituted a strict policy of racial segregation, which again horrified King George VI. The stress of monarchy and war had taken its toll on the king. It didn't help that he smoked a lot and had subsequently developed lung cancer along with other ailments. This affected him greatly as he could no longer travel to the Commonwealth countries. He died on the 6th of February 1952. He was found dead in his bed at Sandringham at 7.30pm. The public mourned the loss of King George VI and upon hearing of her father's death in Kenya, Princess Elizabeth now became Queen. She was invited to be the next leader also of the Commonwealth of Nations, totaling 54 nations, the most recent one voting in in 2020. The whole life of King George VI is very hard to fit into a half an hour movie, so I have had to select what parts to put into this film and what to leave out. But if you do wish to know more or read up more, I have two books I can recommend. So this book is King George VI written by Sarah Bradford and tells the whole story in regards to King George VI's battle with his stutter. And the other book, and this one, which is called The King's War. This is very good because it's actually co-authored by Mark Logue. That's right, the grandson of Lionel. So this one is exceptional and it is also uh, beautifully written. It goes into quite a few other details regarding George, uh, including his battle with, you know, going through the war, his battle with his stutter, his ailments, uh, and everything like that. Really recommend this one. I, I just, I love him. I, I just do. Um, just wow. His whole life spans so much and there is a lot more to him. I could have probably gone a lot more in depth. But this video has taken me weeks to prepare, get together, and I hope you enjoy it. I hope you liked it. And um, I'm I, I'm just, yeah, there you go. It's another history video, folks. And it's on one of the people that uh, I look up to when he sits on my desk right there. The other thing that I actually want to show in this video is two medals that I managed to acquire um, from eBay. And... Uh, they're lovely. And these are coronation medals, so let me just show you them. So this is the coronation medal. And King George VI, uh, when he first met Prince Philip, uh, he didn't very much like Prince Philip at the start, but after getting to know him, they got along fine. And obviously, sadly, we have lost Prince Philip. He sadly passed away on Friday. If you haven't seen the tribute video, go and watch that one. Uh, also, forgot to say it in this video, like, subscribe, comment, and if there's any sort of topic or historical topic you'd like me to do a video on, give me some ideas in the description below. I do have a few videos planned for the, you know, historical corner and stuff, but uh, I'm always open to suggestions or what I could have done better or criticism or... Um, polite, nice criticism, you know, not, oh Sam, you're a complete... So what I'm going to do at the end now, folks, it's come to the end of the video, I really hope you did like this video, it's taken a lot of preparation, I've spent a lot of time on it, um, because I wanted to try and get it right, and, and, and just make it one of those that I took time on, because it is some, about someone that, for me, is one of my heroes in life, and, uh, you know, I just want to look up to us, just, uh, it's just me, it's just me folks. Um, but at the end of this video I'm going to do a music trivia to so stay tuned for that. But for now, I'm going to say uh, like, subscribe, go and like the Facebook page if you still haven't. The link is in the description below. I shall see you in the next video. Keep calm, carry on, stay positive, and I shall see you next time. Tatty tatty bye, Babs and Babettes, and toodaloo. this hour when the dreadful shadow of war has passed far from our fathers and homes in these islands.
Europe so singing the Don't worry, man. Hey, Hitler will sort them out. And who will sort out Hey Hitler? Where's the bloody 23? I don't care what woman you carry on with at night, as long as you show up for duty in the morning. With war looming, you've saddled this nation with a voiceless king. It'll be like mad King George III, George the Stammerer, who let his people down so badly in their hour of need. What are you doing? Get up, you can't sit there, get up! Why not? It's a chair. No, it, that is not a chair, that is... That is... That is St. Edward's chair. People have that carved their names on it. chair is the seat on which every king is held and queen... by a large rock. That is the stone of Schoon. You are, are trivializing are you everything. You I don't care you. how many royal Listen to me. <laughs> Listen to me! Listen to me! Listen to you by what right? By divine right, if you must. I am your king. No, you're not. You told me so yourself. You said you didn't want it. Why should I waste my time listening? To because you? I have a right to no, be and I have a voice! Yes, you do. Just say it.